you know you've become friends with another dude when they start ragging on you. And so uh, I'm thankful for my, my friendship with your pastor, Matt. And I actually, for 15 years, would just buzz this sucker. And I noticed it started coming in gray and thought, ah, let's give it a shot, grow it out. And I call this shake what your daddy gave you. So that's what this <laughs> is up here. Um, I'm so thankful to be here. I, I want to um, I, I take a second. She's sitting over in the dark. I want to honor a lady that is here that I've known uh, for my entire life, who was a great member of our faith uh, family church, and uh, you guys have had the pleasure of being able to worship with her and know her as church family for the past few years. Miss Joanne Stewart is sitting all the way in the back there, and she's waiting. Yeah, she's super. She's she's there. Uh, she has been a spiritual grandmother to me, and her husband, her late husband Doug Stewart, is one of my heroes in the faith. And so if you do not know Miss Joanne, don't leave here before you get a chance to meet her. She is a spectacular lady. So I'm glad you're here, Miss Joanne. I'm, I'm super thankful to be here with your church family. And uh, it is a, it's a pleasure, man. Uh, so I've, I've heard so much about ACC over the years. I've been here a, a long time in Glen Burnie. In fact, I saw a few movies in this place when I was a kid. And so, I, I mean, this is, this is home for me. As Matt mentioned in that video, I've been a lead pastor at Faith for the last two and a half years, but I've been on the ministry staff since 2000. And uh, some of you guys, I know your family from our Upward Sports Ministry. You came through with soccer or basketball, so that's why I look familiar, by the way, to some of you. And I was actually born in that church in 1981. It is a, it's an interesting dynamic to pastor people who changed your diapers. It, uh, it is also interesting when they remind you of it from time to time. But it's a, it's a great, great privilege, man. I, I don't want to be anywhere else. I, sometimes I call faith in Glenmorny. It's my hill to die on. This is it, man. I, I'm, I'm a lifer here. Even though I live in Pasadena, Glenmorny is home. My wife, and actually, my, my wife and I actually met in the youth group at Faith. Like, so we're, I mean, we're, we're so much family, we're almost inbred, man. It's like we're, we're there. It is home. But uh, I, I'm, I've heard so much about ACC over the years and had an absolute just joy getting to know Matt over the last year that uh, I've had a chance to meet with him. And, and we've been planning this Better Together conversation for six months. Matt came to myself and Pastor Nate from Abundant Life uh, about six months ago and said, man, I got this idea. And we, we, we blew it up and we, we made it big. We're, we are, um, we're excited about making sure all of us as churches in Glen Burnie who hold together with the gospel and the biblical foundations, know that there is one gospel, there is one Lord, there is one team. And you are on the same team as we at Faith and Furnace Branch Road on the other side of Glen Burnie, same as Abundant Life, who's right up the street from us. We are on the same team. It doesn't matter where you come from or who you are. We're, we're on the same team. And so this, um, th this whole series, this four weeks, I get a chance to kick it off for you, week one of four. It all culminates on the 5th of May with a great service project called Better Together, our outreach going out into our community to let people know that we are serving one Lord, one Jesus, not many different churches. And so I'm, I'm super thankful to be able to start us off on this conversation today. Uh, I'm one of four people, including Matt, over the next four weeks who are going to come in and talk to us about the metaphors that we find in the, ch uh, in, the, in the scripture about the church. So looking at the words of Christ and of the other New Testament writers, what, what, what kind of metaphors or thought process or, or like word pictures are painted to us about how we can view the church. And so we, over the next four weeks, we'll see the church as the bride, the church as the branch, church as a body. And today, we're going to take a look at the church as a building. Now, if you've been a part of any church life, that might make you squirm a little bit because we say all the time, rightly, that the church is not a building, that the church is a people. But I'm going to do my best over the next half hour to convince us that we are slightly wrong in that thought process, that the church is not a building, but the building is not a, well, the ch building's not a church, but the church is a building, and we will get tongue-tied a few times on the way out. So uh, about one year ago, my wife and I learned a very valuable lesson. It was the very first time in our lives that we sold a home. 
It was our first house as a family. We had been in there for 10 years. We, we lived down in the glitzy neighborhood of Magathy Beach Road, and uh, <laughs> it was nothing super spectacular. It was a small house on a small little, little property, and uh, about a year ago, we were able to sell it, and what precipitated this was not wanting to move anywhere, but we had uh, a, a guy come in to service our septic tank. If you are a Glen Burnie person, you have no idea what a septic is until the septic backs up in your backyard. And uh, if you don't know what a septic tank is, every time you flush, it, it, just, it just goes into your backyard. That's what it does. So that's just that's the beauty of Pasadena. Anyway, um, had somebody come out to service our septic tank, and he told us, he said, this thing is 40 years old, which means it's end of life, which means you don't know how lo- much longer you've got on the septic tank. And if, 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 if you have a septic, you know that when the, you replace it, you can't put it in the same spot. It has to be in a different spot. My entire yard was the septic tank. I had no idea where it was going to go unless we burned down the house. So I walked in from that, talking to that contractor, and I told my wife, we're moving. Like, if we can figure out a way to make this somebody else's problem, that's what we're doing. And because we're super spiritual, we sat down and prayed about it and said, Dear Lord, if it be your will, please let this be someone else's problem. And so we put that, we, we did some like other different renovations, put the house on the market. Lo and behold, we get a contract. But if you've been a part of this process, you know that they inspect everything. That's what they do. So she called a septic uh, contractor to come out and inspect the septic tank system. The same guy shows up. <laughs> same contractor. And I thought, oh, man. And, you know, to, 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 to his credit, he wrote the exact same thing. He told me. In the report, he said, it's end of life, it's going to have to be replaced, and it's going to have to be replaced soon. The woman who was buying the house signed off on it. We threw her the keys and ran out of there like the house was on fire. See you later. Like, we're out. Listen, when we were going through that process of looking to sell our home, that home very quickly became a house. It was our first home together. We had lots of great memories there, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of memories that are good, bad, and ugly, the, the kind of memories that take brick and mortar and turn it into a home, even though ours, our house really wasn't made of brick and mortar. It was like made of a wing and a prayer. It was like if Clark Griswold built a house, this was it, but we, we were happy to get out of there. But very quickly, we learned the difference between a home and a house. It became a house to us very quickly. We are out the door. It was nothing more than a building. Please take it. And today, we want to talk about the understanding that the church is not a building, but the church actually is a building. The building is not the church, but the church is a building. And so I'm going to try to do my best to prove us wrong and give us an, uh, an idea, something to hold on to today. Because I want you to see, I want all of us all to see the fact that God has been building this building, being the church, for a long, long time. Um, ten years ago, we, uh, at, at Faith, we, we were redoing our website. And our, our, I don't even know who our web developer was at the time, so I, f- I feel like I can make fun of the web developer uh, because I don't know who it was. Uh, but when they, when they made the website, they took lots of different pictures of our church building, empty. <laughs> well, if you went to the Faith website about 10, 15 years ago, you would have seen a picture of an empty parking lot, an empty worship center, an empty bathroom, an empty hallway, an empty kids wing, an empty, like, do- I mean, it was like, what, 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 are we do- what are we promoting here? I, c- I could just kind of laugh or cry and think of a family who's searching for a church, finds our website and says, wow, honey, check this out. They got walls. They got a bathroom. Look, hey, they got carpet. We're going here, man. They have got a carpet in the church. It's going to be great. Listen, the church is not a building, but the church is a building. We are here to- together um, uh, bounding ourselves and understanding ourselves are, are around one gospel, one Lord, and one scripture for which we all stand on. So today I, I need to take us to a passage of scripture which is going to hope to give us a, a greater understanding of what God is building as a building in the church. And we're going to read from First Peter. First Peter was written by a dude named Peter. He was the disciple, the apostle Peter. He was the guy who walked on water for a little bit and then sunk on water for a little bit. He's the guy that took the knife out and cut the ear off of the, the, the Roman centurion. I mean, he was that Peter. He was, he, was, he was the guy 
guy who was just going to tell you the way it is. He was the guy that's just going to lay it all out there. He didn't sugarcoat anything. He was just Peter. And he, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes a letter to the early church a long time ago, which still applies to us. In fact, I believe as we read it, you will see that it's really kind of written to us as well. Like, not just applies to us, but we're included in here. And so to kind of give us an understanding of what we're going to read, I'm going to read to you the very first paragraph that he writes in this letter, which is going to show exactly who he was writing to, but it's also going to pull us in. He says, Peter, this is Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those chosen, living as exiles, dispersed abroad in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient, to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Peter is writing to the people that he calls chosen, who are dispersed in a long, just kind of area, region of the day. That they're all over the place. And he calls them to the people who are chosen. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, you know that in the Old Testament, the word chosen had a lot of weight to it. It meant that you were born into the Hebrew family, into the Jewish household. You were born into the nation of Israel. You were, you were part of the chosen people where Yahweh was your God and you were his people. You were chosen. That's who you were. But in the New Testament, of which we're reading today, chosen has a different understanding. Because it's not about who you were born into the first time. It's not about the family and the place and the people for whom you were born to. It's where you were born in the spirit. As Jesus talks to the, the, um, the Pharisee Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Jesus says that you must be born again. Meaning it doesn't matter where you come from, who your parents are. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks you were, what side of Glen Burnie, or if you lived in swanky Pasadena. It doesn't matter where you were born in that family or where anything was or how it was. It matters how you were born into the Spirit. And when you were born into the Spirit, you were chosen, you were adopted as a son, as a daughter of Almighty God. So Peter's writing to the people who are chosen, who are spread all over the place, meaning it doesn't matter whether you're in Asia, you're in Bithynia, you're in all of these different places that are hard to pronounce. It doesn't matter whether you're at ACC on Aqua Heart Road or whether you're at Faith Baptist Church on Furnace Branch Road. It doesn't matter where you are or where you started. It matters, are you a follower of Christ. And if you are, this applies to us. You may be dispersed, you may be spread out, but if you find yourself among the chosen, then Peter's about to lay down some law for us. Peter, the guy that hardly thought before he spoke, is about to lay down some, 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 some words for us and is just going to kind of make it real plain. So skip over one chapter in chapter two, starting in verse one. He says, therefore, Rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, and all slander. Uh, just, just, uh, can we focus on that for just a second? All malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Could you imagine if any of our churches could get that right? How different it would be. If we could just get just one verse right. Paul... <clears throat> Peter just got done in this chapter previous talking about how God has freed us to live holy. He's freed us to, to, to live in his righteousness. And then he comes back with one quick little quip and he says, stop enslaving yourselves to your previous life. Get rid of all of that. You've been freed to live holy. You've been freed to live righteous. So stop going back to that nonsense. I'm so thankful that it's, we've been uh, planning this series, this Better Together movement, this understanding that there has never been among myself or your Pastor Matt or Pastor Nate as we've been doing this, there's never been an understanding of, of competition. There's never been a us versus them or, hey, man, we're doing this better than you or you're doing this better than me. There's, there's never been a, hey, you're winning, we're losing, you're, you're uh, winning, we're losing, we're losing, you're winning. There's, there's never been this, this, this kind of bowing up measuring stick kind of man ego kind of thing there's there's been brotherhood and unity and understanding that we are all on the same team because it doesn't matter where we were born or how we're functioning now It, it matters how we were chosen in christ in the spirit right paul says it doesn't matter whether you're jew whether you're greek whether you're slave whether you're free whether you're male whether you're female it matters that we're all one in christ 
It doesn't matter whether you're on Aqua Heart Road on Sundays or whether you're on Furnace Branch Road on Sundays. We are all here together in Christ. There are two categories of people in this world. You are either saved or you're unsaved. You are either believing on Jesus Christ or you're not. You are either following him or you're not. You are either on the team or you're off the team. There is one dividing category in all of humanity, and it has nothing to do with black, white, red, or blue, or, you know, Glen Burnie or Pasadena. It has everything to do with are you on the team of Christ? Christ. And if you are, my brothers and sisters, my fellowship of the saints, even though I'm not here with you every single Sunday, even though you're not with me every single Sunday, my brothers and sisters, you and I who are chosen, this is for us. So let's put aside all of the envy and the hypocrisy and the deceit and the competition that is between churches. I, I will repent in front of you that not recently, but you know, just growing up in church life there. It was a, a mentality within me from just kind of, you know, I, I feel better than some other churches. And, and, and that church is not really doing all that well, and we're doing pretty well. And that church is, well, oh, that church is doing really, really well. I wish we were doing really, really well, too. Let's put aside all of the competition and realize we are all in need of joining the team to promote the gospel. Why? Because our community needs us to stop fighting and warring against each other. Our community needs unity in the gospel so that they can hear what is true and what is right. Let's let's, let's, let's sit on that verse this week as you are moving in your daily life. He continues in verse 2. He says this. Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word so that you may grow up into your salvation desire the word like pure milk like an infant does milk so that you might grow up in salvation if you've had the opportunity to have children and nurse those children you know that they cry when they want to be fed they cry when they want milk it's not because they're trying to be difficult it's because they're trying to let you know i need something i need sustenance i need to be fed i need it when's the last time you have metaphorically cried because you have absolutely desired the word of God? Or are you like too many Christians who you could go days without spending any time in the word of God and feeling any loss? When is the last time you've desired to grow up in your salvation with the men and women and the brothers and sisters around you? When is the last time it has been an absolute need for you or are you like way too many Christians where you you can go one week two week three weeks a month ah, before you come back to church and fellowship with the communion of the saints without feeling a loss Peter continues in verse three he says if you have tasted and you've seen that the Lord is good then you'll understand when you understand that Christ is not just the great you know some some great hope of the world but he is the only hope of the world. When you understand the only way for you to live with power is to be plugged into the outlet, when you understand the only way for you to grow is to be able to feast on the word that God has given you, when when we can understand that together, then let's grow together. So Peter starts off this chapter by saying, look, hey, you guys were enslaved to a bunch of nonsense before, so stop going back to it. In the meantime, know that everything that you need, like milk for a baby, is found in Christ alone. So take it, grab it, grow with it, use it, enjoy it. And he says, here is why. Here's why. And we're going to read verses 4 through 10, and I want you to see what God is building. As you come to him, who's Jesus, who is a living stone, rejected by people but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built into a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Continue reading. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and an honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe, but for the unbelieving... The stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone, and it's a stone that they stumble over, a rock that they trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word, and they were destined for this. But you, but we, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possessions, so that you and I may proclaim the praises of the one, the God, who called you and I out of darkness into his marvelous light. For once you and I, we... 
We're not a people, but now you and I, we are God's people. You and I had not received mercy at one point in time, but now you and I, we have received mercy. We come together, all of us. Did you see it in verse 4 and 5, by the way? I'm going to back up and read it to you again. Here, here's, here's why we, we enjoy the freedom of righteousness and holy living. Here's why we join together, we crave after God, and we grow together. Here's why we do all of it. As for, excuse me, as you come to him, verse 4, Jesus, a living stone who was rejected by people but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves, we, we are living stones, a spiritual house, are being built by, uh, into a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. That we, ourselves, are living stones stones we're living stones being built into a spiritual house to offer sacrifices we the church are a building being built by god himself that we are all stones being put together in the same building for the same plan for the same purpose for the glory of god we all dispersed across Glen Burnie and asia we are all living stones being brought together for the glory of god Back in 2015, my wife and I had the great privilege of going on a vacation to Europe, and we spent four days in Rome. And while we were there, we stayed in an Airbnb on this first level Italian flat that was there. And I mean, it was in a residential area, like two, two blocks away from the Vatican. And one morning I woke up and heard like a thousand voice choir singing from the Vatican. It was pretty spectacular. But uh, every single morning, we, I would get up, and she would be sleeping, and I'd get up, and I'd walk down to go to the coffee shop, and I, I felt like a real Italian, man. I was out ordering a pastry and a cappuccino, and people were talking to me, and I just smiled and nodded and acted like I knew what they were saying, and I said, grazie, and I left. That's all I could figure out, but I, I felt like a real Italian. But I would go back to that apartment, to that flat, and sometimes for, I mean, at least once a day, I would stare at the wall in the apartment, because the wall in that apartment was exposed stone. I mean, it was like the least child-friendly place in the world. I mean, it was sharp, it was hard, it was rough. It was exposed stone, and the mortar was not like a, like a, a real nice, uh, just pretty mortar. It was the kind that like just spilled outside of the stones that were there. And I, I remember the word that the owner of the, the, the house, um, the building, the, the apartment, told us when we checked in for the Airbnb. I remember her telling me that this building was more than 500 years old. And I, and I remember looking at the, I mean, the original stone, this original wall that's been there for half a millennia, and thinking, this wall is older than pretty much everything back home. Like the United States of America, this wall has been standing here longer. Now, some of the, uh, the, the, the floors that were above us had been built in previous generations, and, you know, had kind of been built on another, but that wall that we had in our apartment on floor one was been there for 500 years, standing strong and resolute, and had been built on over the generations and over the years, standing on that same wall, all connected through the mortar in between, and Peter's saying, that's what we are. That's what we are, that we are all living stones being built together in a spiritual house, all Connected, all of us connected, meaning Faith Baptist Church on Furnace Branch Road, Abundant Life Church on Furnace Branch Road, and ACC here on Aqua Heart Road, connected together in what God is doing, being built together as living stones in a spiritual house. All of us connected, Glen Burnie, the church of, connected in together with what God is doing, and it's not just here. People across the world, we've got mission churches in Chennai, India. Uh, Abundant Life, I know, is doing work in Kenya and, and, and some in, in Cartagena, Colombia. And all of the church, all over the world in 2018, connected together with what God is doing. Living stones being built together as a building, as a spiritual house. And it's not just what God is doing now. All of the men and the women and the great saints that have gone before us, all who have paved the way. I think of men like Billy Graham or Martin Luther King Jr. or Adoniram Judson, these great missionaries that have gone before, John Wesley, Martin Luther, men and women of the Reformation, these people who have gone before us that God has connected us in with, we are connected with them. We're connected with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, and Paul and what God is doing. They are living stones. We are living stones being built together in the same spiritual house for the glory of God. We're connected in with Mary, the mother of Christ, with uh, with. Joseph, his stepfather, with John the Baptist, connected in with them. We're connected in with the Old Testament prophets. Think of Jeremiah, Nehemiah, and Job, and Isaiah, and these men who 
We're connected in with them. We're connected in with Solomon and David and the kings of Israel. We're connected in with, uh, with Moses and Aaron and Joshua and the men who took the nation of Israel into the promised land. We're connected in with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all that God has built and been doing for millennia. We are connected in with them as living stones, even now in 2018, being built into a spiritual house, all under the plan of God, the purpose of God, the power of God, and all of us are being held up by a cornerstone of truth, a cornerstone of grace, a cornerstone of strength, that same cornerstone that the foolish have rejected, but those of us who are humble enough to realize we need a Savior like we need milk. We stand on the cornerstone that is Jesus, holding us resolute, holding us strong through the generations that since the beginning of time, all of the men and women who have had faith in God and God has counted to them the righteousness that he imputes we are all being built together in the same spiritual house the building is not the church but the church is most definitely a building for which god is doing amazing work through giving us an opportunity to join across the generations for his glory and the building that he is putting together has different walls and sections that's just what a building is And the minute one wall says to the other wall, we're more important than you. The minute one wall says to the other wall, we've got better things going on. The minute one wall says to the other wall, hey, you guys don't, you you don't really know what you're doing, and we're a whole lot better than you over here. And the minute that the lower walls, the walls that have been there, and the orthodoxy of our Christian faith, and the men and women who have gone before gets built on by some of the newer generation of 2018, and the minute the 2018 generation say to the people of orthodoxy and tradition that you have no idea what you were talking about, and the minute that the older generation says to the new, you guys are idiots and you have no idea what you're talking about, is the minute the building is on shaky ground. And that is when Humpty Dumpty is not going to be the only one falling off the wall. That's when the wall itself is going to have a great fall because Christ himself said a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And you and I have been doing a horrible job, all of us, at keeping unity within the church. We've been creating divisive, dividing walls that just don't make any sense. And the fact of the matter, there is one team, there is one Lord, there is one baptism that brings us all together, and we, as a people, must do our best to bring together the kingdom which will stand in his strength. So what? So what? I mean, we, we can talk in big general terms like this as a church and say, hey, well, you, and you guys are connected with faith, and faith is connected with you, and we've been connected through the generations, and, and so, so what? What, what? what do you do personally? Two thoughts that you can hold on to today. Number one, as a living stone, allow yourself to be placed in the wall. Allow yourself to be placed. Because God our Father is not just a uh, potter that shapes us. He is a mason who places us. He is the one who says, I have a purpose and a plan, and I birthed you in this generation and in this town for this reason. So allow yourself to be placed in the wall. Allow yourself to be built into the household of God, because a brick does no good when it's just sitting in the pile. So you, as a living stone, come together and be a part of the household of God. In addition, don't just be one who visits the house of God, but be built into the house of God. Um. So it's easier for me to say this here than it is for my church in Furnace Branch Road. Some of you do nothing here more than show up on a Sunday and leave. You are visiting the house of God, not being built into it, which means you're a useless brick in the pile. As living stones, allow yourself to be placed into the wall. Second, thrive in that place know that the creator god has created you for that plan and for that purpose and he has also created the whole for you to fill meaning you have been built for that place for the perfect time and season to fill that role in that hole in the wall And he has built us as a holy nation, a royal priesthood, meaning we're to be a holy, righteous wall. But way too many churches, I'm sure it's not too much different here at ACC like it is at Faith. We're not a holy wall, we're a wall full of holes. Because there's way too many people who walk in the door, they deny their God-given calling. 
to be a part of what he's been building since the beginning of time. And we would rather just be spectators. It's time to allow yourself to be placed in the wall, in the holy household that God is building together so that you may thrive in your purpose and in your placement. Very easily, one of the ways that we have uh, just super easy for you to get involved in is this Better Together outreach that's coming up on May 5th. May 5th is when we're going to be taking people from Abundant Life and from ACC and from Faith, and every single team is going to be mixed up with people from all three churches. We're going to give you a free t-shirt, meaning you're going to all be wearing the same t-shirt, and you're going to have no idea who the other people is, and you're going to have no idea because there is no dividing line. We're removing all of the dividing lines to say we're all on the same team. And so I cannot stress to you enough, be a part of this, because May 5th, th- this, this series, this four weeks is... We are absolutely 100% praying that this is not a four-week bump, but this is the beginning of a movement for which the church in Glen Burnie might combine together for the glory of the gospel. And so as I'm going to continue to implore and pray for my uh, faith family, for whom many of them I grew up with, I pray for you as well, and I pray that we would all be praying for each other, knowing that we, like an infant craves milk, should crave growing up in our salvation together. And if nothing else, our community needs the church to tell them a better story. Because if we want to preach reconciliation in Christ, we better daggone show it amongst brothers and sisters within the church. That Jesus doesn't just rescue us from our sin, but he rescues us from the dividing lines for which man has created. In just a minute, we're going to sing a song called Amazing Grace. This is Amazing Grace. And I want us to understand as we sing this song that the absolute ability and and blessing it is to be built into the wall. We are not deserving of it. We're not being called into the wall in something we have to do. We get to be built into the wall and into the household of God. And that, my brothers and sisters, is amazing grace and the amazing gift of Jesus. Let me pray for us as we continue to worship. Lord God, I, um, I thank you for my brothers and sisters and their spirit and their ability to see your scripture and the truth therein. And I pray that you would continue to bind us together as one team, as one family, as people following after one Lord, one baptism. And, and, and I, in front of a room of some friends, some strangers, I, I confess that I have not done that well all the time. That, that I have at times felt competitive. I have at times um, felt a sense of ego or a sense of envy in the church. God, may I celebrate the wins that you give ACC just as loud as I celebrate the wins that you give faith. May the people of God celebrate what the God of us, your people, do in all of us. Lord, build us into a household through your amazing grace. Jesus.